Well, good morning and welcome, and thanks so much for joining us. For those of you visiting, my name is Pastor Roger. Well, actually, the pastor part's not in my actual legal documentation. But uh, I'm the teaching pastor here, and if you're visiting with us, we want to say thank you, and so thank you so much for joining us. We're going to continue on a series on the book of Corinth, uh, well, Corinthians. And we're actually, um, next week, the week after, so three more weeks, we're going to wrap this series up. It feels like we've been in this one for a while, but man, has it been chocked full of goodness. Let's recap what we talked about two weeks ago, because last week we were at the uh, Thanksgiving service at Wellesley Community Church, for those who are able to join us, and, and hopefully uh, we'll be announcing our Christmas time together with them as well, but that's coming up. So let's talk about last, uh, last time we were together. So we were looking at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and remember, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is the love chapter, right? And I was trying to save the love chapter from weddings. Right? And as I said to you last time that we were together, that this passage of scripture is most often read at weddings. And again, nothing wrong with that, because if you see as a, a bride and groom sharing this, you know, thoughts of love together, and you know, those who are sitting in the audience who might be married, you're going to elbowing each other, like, hey, remember that one, right? But the fact is, that's not what Paul's talking about. The application of this, uh, of this verse is seen in verse uh, 1, 2, and 3. It's others. It's, it's not meant to be a romantic, sappy, emotional passage, emotional perhaps, but what Paul was saying is, listen, church, Corinth, love each other. Love those who are not inside the church. Love those who hate you. Love those who are uh, actively working against you. The application of this verse is a lot more controversial and, 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 and countercultural in the sense when you understand it in this context, right? And remember, we looked at the great theologian Tina Turner, and we asked the question, what's love got to do with it, right? And, and the, the, well, thanks for people who even know who Tina Turner is, uh, because, you know, I'm, I'm getting a little up there in age. Um, so we looked at, like, what's love got to do with it? And what's love got to do with it, with it is that love is the glue that's meant to hold this very fractured thing we call church together. I've talked about this before, and I know you're getting really tired of it, but this, this whole idea of the splintering of evangelicalism, right? Churches have been, never been more fragmented, more divided than it's in, 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 I think, almost in history. Maybe, uh, again, for those of you history buffs, 7th century. Uh, but apart from that, the church has never been more divided. And what Paul is trying to say is that, you know, like, as we are pulling ourselves apart, as we are trying as much as possible to hate each other for, uh, you know, cultural reasons, love is meant to pull us together. And remember, we looked at the list here, and I said, when Paul is describing what love looks like, he kind of gives us what lovelessness or loveless looks like, but then he talks about what loving looks like. And I said to you, what really the way to kind of simplify it is lovelessness is stagnation. If you are not moving forward, if you are not growing in your faith, I just want you to know that might be the first symptoms of lovelessness, right? Because whatever love is, it is an active agent meant to transform. It is meant to move us beyond our prejudices, meant to move past our, our cultural labels into something more, um, I would say, subversive, but also profound. But when we look at the other side there about what love actually looks like, it's transformative, right? It's, it's, just, it's again, the active ingredients of what transformation looks like. Remember, love is not about loving those who love you. Remember what Jesus says, right? What good is it if you love those who love you, right? That, that's actually, and, and you know, the two phrases that Jesus used to describe that, that's what the corrupt tax collectors and pagans. So if you love family and friends, you're nothing more than a pagan. Just let that sink in for a second. That's the level that Jesus says. If you can love those who love you, if you can love those who think the same of, as you, if you can love those who have the same political, uh, sociological, cultural you know, labels as you, well, that's, pagans do that. And again, I, 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 I used a really weird story. Uh, I, I, love, uh, I love true crime. I've mentioned that before. And uh, I, I loved, uh, I listened to this whole podcast and watched this whole documentary on Pablo Escobar. Pablo Escobar, if you, for those of you who may know, was one of the leading, uh, um, you know, cocaine drug dealers uh, back in the 80s, right? Like, again, this guy was ruthless, as ruthless as can be. Yet, when you talk to family members, he was loving and caring. So just so you know, if I could, if I could use the Roger Stone official version of the Bible, what good is it if you love those who love you? You're no better than Pablo Escobar. Yeah, yeah, tweet that. Um, and so... And we looked at the very last verse here at verse 13, because Paul kind of brings it together. And he uses a very famous passage of faith, hope, and love. 
But what I wanted to say to you is that when I look at this and I look at how he phrases it, something kind of le leapt out at me that it wasn't about faith, hope, and love because Paul says love is the greatest, but it was almost like a mathematical formula. Love is a force multiplier, right? And so when I looked at it, when I saw it, I thought that faith plus hope equals love, right? So faith is this idea that whatever you are loving at some point in time might be transformed, might become better than it is. There's a hope, there's this there's this hope again that not based upon who they are, but based upon who God is, that that could actually change. And then that is what equals love. So for those of you who didn't know, that's what we talked about last week. This morning, we're going to look at a really weird chapter because Paul, Paul is going to do what you do in an essay. So if you've ever been in an exam and you're writing an essay and you say, you know, oh, I've got a half hour to write this essay. And you get that first introduction and the first paragraph done and you look at your watch and it's like, oh, I've got five minutes left. You're like, ah, rats, and you start like, just writing like verbal diarrhea, just kind of fill into space to make sure you have something in. Well, chapter 14 might be Paul's verbal diarrhea because he's wrapping up this first letter of the church in Corinth, and he's going to bring a lot of topics this morning, and we're, we're going to look at it. But before we do that, um, a survey came out recently, and the survey is called the uh, State of Theology. Uh, it's by an organization called Ligonier, which is just a, a, a organization. It's them and, and someone else put together. And basically what they did is they surveyed 3,011 uh, 3, people between January 5th and January 23 of 2022. So it's very recent. And what I want to show you is some of the things they came up with, right? So what they do every year is they ask people, Christians and non-Christians alike, just obvious questions. So a question might be like, um, do you agree with this statement? God is a perfect being and cannot make a mistake, right? So the question is, is this an idea that you can have. Now, what's interesting about this survey, and I didn't want to go too uh, much in the weeds in this, is they do separate out those who would identify as not Christian and those who identify as Christian. But what's very remarkable, especially in this one, this past one, is that those who are non-Christians and those who are Christians, they kind of almost answered this kind of the same, which is kind of interesting. So we look at this idea of God is perfect being and cannot be ma make a mistake. 51% uh, agree. Just to be clear, that's kind of low. Right? Whether it's Christian or non-Christian, that's kind of low. Uh, another one, there is one triune God and three persons. 54% of people go, yeah, I, I agree with that statement. Uh, and again, there is just, again, I'm not, I'm not uh, going too much in the weeds, but it's strongly agree, somewhat agree, don't agree, strongly disagree. You know, the, the four categories, right? Um, but I'm just going to strongly agree, the, the kind of the first two there. Uh, God learns and adapts to different circumstances. 32% agree, which again, believe it or not, that's actually a good sign. Uh, biblical accounts of the physical bodily resurrection resurrection of Jesus are completely accurate. This event actually occurred. 47% agree. Which, by the way, spoiler alert, we're going to talk about next week. Uh, Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. 31% strongly agree. 22% somewhat agree. I just want to put that one in there so you can kind of see that. And finally, everyone is born innocent in the eyes of God. And this was kind of remarkable. 53% agree. And just so you know, within um, Christianity, within those who identify as Christians, it was 65% agree. Which, in case, again, no spoiler alerts here, we believe in this concept of original sin. That's a whole different conversation. So that may not be as quite accurate as you want. Now, what's interesting about this and what, what makes, makes this uh, survey really remarkable is that there is more access for Christians today than in, in the entirety of history to biblical materials. So it could be said in the early 1900s, you may not have read the Bible. The Bible may not have been translated into your language. Or you may not have access to a commentary. And you could say, well, I believe this because that's what I was told. I don't know any else. And you kind of go, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Right? And again, you go, go back, 1800s, 1700s, however you want to go. And again, we're getting to the point of almost illiteracy at this point. But today, today, and again, not to get too much in the weeds, but where do people get their ideas on theology? Social media. Right? TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, right? Little sound bites of, of scripture. And you see these things, people on, on, on TikTok, whether they're doing a stupid dance or they're doing somebody else, like, oh, that, that seems accurate. And what I love about what uh, Justin DeHilly says is this. It's astonishing how spiritually malnourished we can be amid such an abundance of biblical availability. Now, I like that idea of spiritual malnourishment because what he's saying is absolutely correct, right? When we look at this idea of our spiritual health, we have access to a smorgasbord, I hope I'm saying that correct, uh, of, of materials that we could access to learn about the Bible. We're just lazy, 
Um, another commentator, Eliza Lee, she says this, instead of filling our souls with the rich word of God, we fill it with Instagram posts, funny memes, YouTube videos, and episodes of The Bachelor. I'm not, I'm not talking about anybody in particular, uh, but I am saying that this is true. So what, what, what's interesting about this is that the survey of how we think biblically or how we think of theology is remarkable, not just because of what non-Christians think, because we got to go, yeah, okay. But it's really the Christians that are kind of, it would be more scandalous to take a look at. Um, I heard one, one definition of theology, because when we, when we use the word theology, a lot of connotations come to mind. But theology simply is this, what we think about God. That's very simplistic. This is why when I had a conversation with an atheist, I kept calling him a theologian. They did not like that, but I did not care. Because the funny thing is, with atheism, you're thinking about God, you just don't realize it. You don't call that theology, but that's exactly what theology is. And so theology is simply what we think about God. To think biblically, we must first understand the Bible and ultimately God's revelation of himself. This is what an authentic disciple of Jesus does. And this is, a, this is a very different conversation, but this is one we've had at UCC now for, I don't know, since its beginning. But what does an authentic disciple of Jesus look like? See, we have a lot of uh, cultural Christians. Uh, Mitch and I were talking in the lobby, and the phrase that I've been thinking about is disconnected Christian. And, and the image in my mind is, you know, think about in the, in, you know, back when, we f when humanity first got, went, went to space. Right? In the early days, uh, as you, you'd go outside of the, uh, the shuttle, for example, you would have this long hose that would feed you oxygen. And if that hose ever got caught, uh, cut, your oxygen supply would, would go away and you would die. But yet you would still fall in space and you would be indistinguishable from alive or dead. That is what disconnected Christianity looks like to me. That at some point in time, a Christ follower could be somebody who says, yes, I identify with his group, with his cultural label, or with Jesus. We go, great. But at some point in time, in that spiritual development process, they stopped. They just stopped growing. They stopped learning. They stopped kind of challenging themselves. And I would call a disconnected Christian. And so what we are trying to struggle with as, as Christians today is, what does an authentic disciple of Jesus look like? And that authenticity isn't about sinfulness or past and all that, because goodness gracious, we all kind of have that, that baggage in our lives. But to me, an authentic uh, disciple of Jesus is somebody who is actively engaged with their creator. That's what I would look at. Now, before we kind of jump into what we want to talk about this morning, let's just remind ourselves about the four areas that the church in Corinth is struggling with. And it's, one, it's these four areas that drew my attention to this particular book because the four areas that they are struggling with, we struggle with today, right? So Corinth is sensual, right? Remember, the, the Corinth was the Las Vegas of the Roman Empire, right? Remember the phrase I told you at the very beginning and, 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 and the, first ep the first time, first episode. That's what we should call our series. Yeah, the first episode. Um, the first time we started talking about church in Corinth, I showed you the Latin phrases they said, right? If you go to Corinth, bring lots of money because there was lots of ways of indulging the sensual part of it, right? Uh, Corinth is a, a uh, maritime town. In other words, lots of uh, sailors come into the town, and therefore they want to find indulgences, right? The largest temple to Aphrodite, right? A thousand prostitutes there were at, were at the disposal of any sailor, right? So Corinth is sensual. And guess what? So are we. Corinth is immature, Right? This is the no-duh moment. But again, Western Christianity falls in this category as well, too. Corinth is struggling with transformation. And again, that could be all of us, really. And Corinth is trying to blend the gospel and culture. And we'll see this. We've seen this consistently. All right? So every time we get together, before we jump into a chapter, um, I try to give you some questions, uh, a question to think about. Well, this morning, i got to give you three. Because remember, I told you, Paul is writing an essay, and he realizes he wants to wrap it up here. And so he's going to give us three topics in this chapter. And this morning, I'm not going to go verse by verse. Instead, I'm going to kind of group the verses together because Paul, again, has a bit of, not to be disrespectful to Paul, but he's got a bit of verbal diarrhea here, and I need to kind of condense it down because there's three areas we need to talk about and three areas that I think the church has kind of got wrong a little bit. So the questions that we're going to answer this today is, what is New Testament prophecy? Should I speak in tongues? Does Paul hate women? Part deux. I just felt like as Canadians, we shouldn't have that, you know, a little French content in there. And so, you know, I just, I just feel that's appropriate, right? So these are the three questions we need to answer today. Because in chapter 14, there are some wildly wrong assumptions about this idea. 
right? So are there present day prophets? It's an interesting question. Do you speak in tongues? Should you speak in tongues? Why don't you speak in tongues? And finally, does Paul hate women? Right? We've already talked about this once, but one of the largest, what we call proof text, proof text is just a fancy way of saying, oh, look, this the Bible agrees with what I think anyways. Right? It's actually embedded in this chapter. And so we kind of have to go through and kind of go, did Paul really say that? You know, it's funny, as I was working through the series, I kind of came, my idea for my Easter series kind of popped up out of this. And uh, I'm going to call it something like upside down Easter or something like that, because of all the events that we get wrong, Easter might be the top of the list of all the things that happen at Easter. We just, we completely get wrong. And so, no spoilers there, but uh, that's what we're looking at. So let's start off with by talking about prophecy, okay? Because prophecy is a fun topic, right? Because people are, are, are uh, um, immediately attracted to the idea of, of a prophet or, or, or prophetic statements. I get many YouTube channels or blog links sent to me about prophets or prophecy. Pastor, did you see this prophecy? Right? During the, how do I say this in a gentle way? The political upheavals of America, there was lots of prophecy going around. I got a lot of the uh, emails sent to me or video links sent to me. Oh, there's a, there's a prophet, prophet so-and-so said this. Oh, exciting. I, I want to know what prophet so-and-so says. But is this actually accurate? Is this actually biblical? And the funny thing is, no one ever asks that question anymore. We just assume it is. Is it? So let's take a look at what Paul says first before we kind of, oh, wait, did I? Oh, no. Okay, good. I'm a little bit ahead of myself, but that's okay. So in chapter 13, remember what Paul says. Paul says, you know what? Spiritual gifts don't mean anything. But just so you know, in chapter 12, he says, hey, spiritual gifts are great. But in chapter 13, he says, spiritual mean, gifts mean nothing unless you have love. Right? Now, what I love about that idea is simply this. For those of you who were there for the spiritual gifts uh, conversation that we have, whether it's the gifts or the fruit of the Spirit, you can say, and quite rightly, I don't know if the Spirit of God has used me in this way in the past. And yet I get to go, okay. But what you can't say is I don't get to choose the way of love. Love is, and for those of you who've been married for any amount of years, it's a choice. It's always a choice. That's the frustrating thing about love, right? And that's the deceptiveness of love in culture today. We feel it make it an emotional state, right? Whether it's in movies or music or television, it's an emotional state. I feel love or I don't feel love. But as Christ kind of deals with it, as the Bible deals with it, love is actually always at its, uh, at its primary a choice. So he starts off at chapter 14 and says this. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gift of the Spirit, especially prophecy. Kind of a bold way to start off with. So if I was to say to you, like, what is prophecy? Don't put your hands up. But think to yourself, what's prophecy? Without surveying you, because surveys have been done about this, and I don't think, well, I do think you're all extraordinary. But most people, if I said to them, what's prophecy? It's telling the future. Ooh, Nostradamus. Yeah. Nostradamus, he predicted 9-11. No, he didn't. Anyways, that's a whole different conversation, right? But prophecy is like, oh, people are giving glimpses into the future. That's what prophecy is. But I would say to you, in a gentle, loving, pastoral way, you're a moron. <laughs> in the Greek, it translates much better. I'm just, no, I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm kidding, not kidding. For those who are visiting, just to... I'm kidding. Okay, but let's take a look at what Paul says. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take the verses he talks about prophecy, and let's see what Paul has to say about prophecy. So in verse 3, he says this, But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Now, if prophecy was only about foretelling the future, would it meet these categories of strengthening, encouraging, and comfort? I would say perhaps not. In verse 24 or 25, it says this, But if an unbeliever or inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, they are con uh, convicted of sin and are brought under judgment by all, as the secrets of their hearts are laid bare. So they will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. In verse 29, Two or three prophets should speak, and others should weigh carefully what is said. And, of, and of course, verse 31 for, all, for you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. Now, 
These are the major verses of what Paul's talking about with prophecy in, in this chapter here. Now, remember, Corinth is predominantly a Gentile church. There are Jews there, and we're going to talk a little bit of that in a second, but the last part there. And so when Paul is trying to teach them what it means to be a Christ follower, he's talking to Gentiles. Prophecy, by the way, is not particularly a biblical thing. There were prophets, pagan prophets. So there were prophets of Aphrodite, prophets of Zeus. There were prophets in these temples. So prophecy isn't just the realm of Jewish people or of Christians that existed in the culture. And so what Paul is saying here is how Christians view prophecy is vastly different than how culture deals with prophecy. As I've said before, and I just intonated that, is prophecy is not, in most cases, foretelling of the future. See, most often prophets, when they're, when they're held up in culture today, it's because they, they're predicting the future. Now, the problem with that is that when we move into the New Testament, and even in the Old Testament, prophets didn't do that. See, if I, if I was to give you a, a simplified version of prophecy, a prophet is a person who is able to look at the state of the church or of Israel and see where they are sinning and point it out to them. A prophet is actually kind of an interesting... So a lot of... <laughs> whenever I do a pause there, I'm trying to think, okay, how do I explain this? A lot of conversation today about power and balance are happening. Right? Who should hold power, and how do they actually act that power out? Should police, should government, should organizations, should individuals? Who should make decisions for every other person? That's a different conversation, but a lot of people are talking about power imbalances, and I like it. It's a good conversation. Well, in the Old Testament, you had the king, and the king was an individual who held absolute power. And the, the reason the king had absolute power is because the king had the army or the military behind him. And you go, okay, that makes sense. But according to scripture, the king did not hold absolute power. Why? Because the priest, who was the person who showed the law of God, was meant to counterbalance the king and what they did. So the king, just so you know, fun fact, in the Old Testament, kings had multiple wives. Just so you know, that wasn't God's intent. The kings were not allowed to have multiple wives. The Bible says in the Old Testament that a man should have one wife. Wait a minute, Solomon had a thousand. By the way, that's a headache I don't even want to think about, okay? Like, I, I just don't even want to think about it, but he had a thousand wives. Is that what God intended? No, polygamy was not what God intended. But why did the king get to do it? Who was going to tell him no? Well, the priest was supposed to tell him no, but guess what? The priests were corrupt. Frequently in the Old Testament, the priests were corrupt. So the counterbalance to the king and his power was meant to be the priest. But if both are in cahoots, what do you do? Well, God had an answer to that, and that was the prophets. There is these wild men and women, yes, I said women, and we'll get to that in a second, who God would raise up, and the prophet would come to the king, and the priest will look him square in the eye and say, you're a scoundrel. Right? Remember when David, right, and Bathsheba, who stood up to him? It wasn't the priest, it was Nathan the prophet. Nathan the prophet comes before the king and says, because of what you've done, the child of this union will die. And you and the people of Israel will know what you've done. I don't know how to say this in a nice way, but that takes... That's a, that's a bold statement. How's that, okay? That's a bold, bold statement, right? Because the king could kill you. People didn't t t say things the king didn't want to hear because the king could kill you like that. By the way, when you walked into the throne room of the king... On each side of the king and down the walls were the elite warriors of the king. And by the way, David's mighty men, if you want to go through scripture and see how many people these individuals killed, thousands. So you walk by these individuals who are, who are veterans of the various wars that David had fought. You stand before the king and you call him out for his sin. It's only the prophets who do that. So the prophets are meant to counterbalance power and corruption. In the New Testament, the same applies. Prophets are individuals who are not in the quote-unquote office of the prophet. There are no such thing as prophets today. What they are are individuals who God raises up to speak into the culture. I would say to you that Western Christianity has had a lot of faults. One of them that comes to mind is the environment. 
we as Western Christians have forgotten that the environment in creation is God's domain. And we as Christ followers, right back into the garden, we're meant to have proper harmony with, with the environment. Well, Western Christianity, because of its enmeshment with capitalism, we forgot that. There are so many great Christian theologians who talk about the environment in ways that are so profound. And I think that's beautiful. Why? We have forgotten who we are. And I would say that they are speaking a prophetic voice to remind Christians creation reflects the creator. And in the garden, the thing that God told Adam and Eve is to live in harmony with creation. And we have forgotten that. Just as, as an example, there's so many more, and we'll get to that some more later on. But it's interesting as well, too, about Roger Blaylock. When he, talk, when he, when he surveyed New Testament uh, scriptures on prophecy, there isn't a consensus. right? So when someone says, I'm a prophet, no, you're not. You are somebody, perhaps, that God has used in the past to speak into culture about what it's doing wrong. But if you remember verse 31 of, of chapter 14, God says that all of us can, be pro can, can live out the gifts of prophecy. Um, so prophecy is revelation, head and heart. This is why when, when people who come to church, perhaps if there's somebody who speaks into it, it, it they, they, they're revealed of what they are, an internal and external, and they go, okay, there is a God. And, and prophecy in the New Testament context relies heavily upon the Holy Spirit. Right? It, the Holy Spirit reveals, cuts through all the garbage, and gets to the heart of the matter. Um, in the New Testament, it moves away from office to gift the Spirit, everyone potentially. It can be seen in preaching, teaching, conversation, and worship. This is what prophecy looks like in the New Testament. Ray Stedman on his commentary on this is this. We've already seen that the gift of prophesying is not predicting the future. That may be an element occasionally in it, but it's basically the explanation of the present in the light of the revelation of God. It is applying the worldview of God to circumstances of life. We think of prophecy, and the reason why Paul is so interesting about this is that he's saying, listen, prophecy is important. Prophets should speak. But it's not about, hey, just so you know, this is the future. Here's the lottery numbers for next week's, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, whatever the lottery is right there, right? That's not what prophets do. Instead, prophets get up and say, you know what? We as a church, we've become too narcissistic. We as a church are using our resources for our own pleasure. We as a church have forgotten to worship God. So prophecy is seen in Tim leading worship. Prophecy is seen in conversations you have amongst one another. And prophecy if I do my job right, and that, that, you know, that's a whole different conversation, is in the sense of the idea, the revelation of what we're talking about. So when Paul says prophecy is really important to what happens to the church, you see why. Now let's go on to the next topic of tongues. Do you speak in tongues? Should you speak in tongues? And why don't you speak in tongues? So just as a, as, as a way of front-end loading this, my background is Pentecostal. And because I'm Pentecostal, Pentecostals traditionally... All they cared about was tongues. That was literally, and as, as, as a high school girl, all I heard about was you got to speak in tongues or else you don't love God. I knew I loved God, but I didn't speak in tongues at that time, so I thought, oh, I must not love God. And I can't tell you how many altar calls I went up for to get the gift of tongues. Nobody ever told me, not once, that it may never happen. I was told that it happens to everybody who loves God and receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, the denomination I used to belong to believed that a, that a subsequent gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit was speaking in tongues. I remember as a youth, back in the day before the internet, I was told that if you really loved God and had faith, you would speak in tongues. I can't tell you how much self-loathing and hatred I had of myself because I didn't speak in tongues. Spoiler alert, I did receive the gift of tongues later in life. But at that time, I didn't. And so you'd go to the front, and I'm not asking for someone's miraculous healing. I'm not even asking for money. I'm not even asking for a girlfriend, which, by the way, was a part of my prayer life for I don't know how long, right? I was just asking, Lord, let me speak in tongues, to which I didn't think had any kind of benefit to anything except for me speaking in tongues. But it was like a visible manifestation of what I thought God, God's love for me was. No one ever said to me, by the way, it may not happen. 
It has nothing to do with, with, uh, with your relationship with God. It's up to God and the Holy Spirit what it's to do in your life. So what does Paul say about speaking tongues in this chapter? I'm glad you asked. He says this. He gives us a couple of categories, and I'm going to kind of bring them down. But in chapter, verse 4, he says this. Anyone who speaks in tongues edifies themselves. Hmm, that's kind of interesting. For this reason, the one who speaks in tongues should pray that they may interpret what they say. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I also sing with my understanding. Verse 27, 29. If anyone speaks in tongues, two or at the most three should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. Now, what's interesting about this is in the Bible, in the New Testament, tongues are not unheard of. As a matter of fact, the advent of the Holy Spirit, right? We always talk about advent as a Christmas thing, and that's true, right? It's the incarnation, God the Son, coming in flesh. Well, there is also an advent of the Holy Spirit, the day of Pentecost, right? 50 days after Passover. Well, the advent of the Holy Spirit comes, and it's the gift of tongues that are given to everybody in the upper room. We go, oh, okay. But we see this again throughout the book of Acts, that time and time again, tongues are seen as a gift of, of the Spirit. Now, I could show you a couple of places in the book of Acts where people receive the gift of the Spirit but don't speak in tongues. That's a whole different story. But again, Paul is saying very specific to the church in Corinth. Now, let me kind of help you understand what tongues is all about. Um, speaking in tongues is when an individual speaks a language that he or she does not know. These tongues can include human languages, which the speaker is unfamiliar, or a non-human holy language with which no person is familiar. Now, I do have a story of the first one that usually uh, when I hear stories in, in the, within Pentecostalism, I just figure they're a lie because, you know, if I'm not there to hear it. I, you know what? It's kind of weird to say this, but I'm actually a bit of a skeptical Christian. I know it seems kind of odd, but I, I, I'm i more of a skeptic than I am. Like, oh, yeah, that must be true. I have to kind of experience it for myself before I kind of, I, I you know what? I kind of feel like Thomas had a point. Uh, you know, I know that sounds like a horrible thing to say, but I'm the kind of person, I, I would be the guy saying, Jesus, can I just stick my fingers into your flesh, which seems like a really you thing to do, but... I understand Thomas's reason for it. I do. I, I, I'm that guy, and I'm just telling you this honestly, whether that makes me less of a Christian in your eyes. You know, there's so many other reasons for that. But that's one of them, right? I'm a bit of a skeptic. But what's interesting about this idea with tongues is that I was at a service one time where an individual did speak in tongues, and there was no interpretation. But in Pentecostalism, that didn't really bother us. I did find out, because I was there, that the tongues the person spoke was a language called White Russian. I am not a language expert, but this is what I was told. The reason I was told is because there was an elderly Russian immigrant there who knew the language and had just showed up to the church that day, who had been struggling with God and who had been actually what she had said in her own words because I was there when she told us the story. She was very angry with God because of what took place in her country and took place in her family. Again, the, 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 the atrocities that her and her family faced, I get it. So she came, and I believe it was just for some high holiday reason, like I can't remember the exact date, and so she comes, and someone gives a tongue. She immediately starts crying. Right? And then she comes to the front, and because I was in, in Bible college, I was at the front as well too, and so I was there when the pastor was talking to her, and she says this to the person, because the person who spoke in tongues was there as well too, when did you learn to speak white Russian? Person's like, I don't even know what that is. I didn't realize there was Russian language categorized in colors. I didn't, I didn't know that, right? But what white Russian was, and what she told, and this is her explanation, please understand that, was that it's, it's an archaic form of Russian that was spoken in a particular region of Russia. Okay, didn't know that. But she said, you spoke fluently in Russian, in white Russian, which is one of my languages from my, from my childhood, and you said to me in that language, that God knows what happened to my family, that he loves me, and that he's forgiven those who've hurt me, and that he wants me to come back to him. Now, just to be clear here, and I'm getting a little goosebumpy here on, on the back of my neck. Uh, that seems weird, right? But see, we see this in Acts chapter 2. Remember, the people speak in tongues, they follow the streets, and what do the people say? Why are these people speaking in my language? So that's one example. The other example is you can speak in tongues, and nobody knows what the heck you're saying. And that's just angelic. 
Now, I just want you to know something. At UCC, it's not my job to convince you that the Bible is true. It is my job to show you what the Bible says. You can be here this morning and you can be skeptical. And I go, again, you're in my camp now. But I'm just telling you what I experienced, what I heard, and what I saw. And just so you know, I speak the second form of, of t- tongues. That I speak the tongues and I've spoken it out loud and no one's ever going, hey, I know that language. Never happened to me. So that's the second form of it. And Paul talks about that as well too. Now, there's a phrase called normative, normal versus normative. Let me just unpack that for you. And I wish somebody would explain this to me when it comes to tongues. Tongues is a normal gift of the Spirit. In other words, we've seen it happen. Normative means it doesn't happen for everybody. So you could be a Christ follower for the entire life and never have the gift of tongues. And guess what? God loves you and God wants to use you equally as anybody else. As a matter of fact, Paul does go on to say, by the way, if you never speak in tongues, but you love people, much better. So, you know, no one ever, again, as a Pentecostal, no one ever told me that either, but that would have been kind of impersonal. That would have been kind of important. So there's two types of tongues. Personal, remember when Paul says, when I speak in tongues, I edify myself? I can tell you that in my own personal prayer life, when I speak in tongues, there is this, I don't know how to quite quantify it, but you f- I just I feel like something else is happening. It doesn't always happen. I, again, I don't mind being spooky, but I like to be spooky with my head on my, on my shoulders, right? So yes, it happens, and Paul talks about it, right? He says, anyone who speaks in tongues edifies themselves, right? So speaking in tongues is personal. You, could, you may speak in tongues here, and it could be in your own personal prayer life, and the Bible goes, yes. But there's a second form of it, and that's corporate. So, for example, at Uptown Community Church, we've never had somebody stand up and speak in tongues. But if, should it happen, it can happen. But what Paul says for the corporate, and this is the kind of funny part here, and I'm going to show you this in a second. He says, there must be an interpretation in the corporate. Now, what he never tells us, he never says, and this is the part I've gone like, hmm. He never says, how do you know if someone can be there to interpret Right? I, he, he, just, he, just, he just assumes that someone might be there to interpret it in the church in Corinth. And I go, oh, okay, fair enough. So that's question number two. Question number three we have to spend a little bit more time on. And the question comes from verse 34, which is a proof text for, hey, women, just be quiet. And that's what Paul says. Women should be silent during the church meetings. It is not proper for them to speak. They should be submissive, just as the law says. If they have any questions, they should ask their husbands at home, for it is improper for women to speak in church meetings. Let me show you here why this verse is very controversial. And not controversial in the sense that it's in the Bible. Remember I told you, it's not my job to explain why it's in the Bible. My job is hopefully to give you context. This verse is what's called a proof text. And by proof text, denominationally, people have said, because of this verse, women cannot be in leadership, women cannot be pastors. But you know, I always kind of find it interesting, women can be Sunday school teachers. I always find that kind of interesting. It's almost as if, yeah, women can speak to children, but I always say to them, women children or men children? Because if that's the case, then you're not really being authentic. And hu- Anyways, that's a whole different conversation. Oh, by the way, women can be missionaries, but they just can't speak of the Western church, which again, might be a little bit of a form of racism, but that's a whole different conversation. Simply put, this verse has been approved text for denominations who say, yeah, you know what? This verse is is... Is, uh, is, is superior to other verses. Now, let me just show you something here. Uh, Dr. Michael Morrison says this. Paul has indicated that women can pray and prophesy in church. Where does it uh, do this? Chapter 11. We've talked about that. And a worship service includes two or three people prophesying in turn. This means that it is permissible for women to have formal speaking roles in the church. Paul was apparently forbidding some other type of speech. Ah, just as he did not allow tongue speakers or prophets to speak out in turn, he did not want women to speak out of turn, saying these things in such a way that they were breaking social customs about what is appropriate. Hmm. So Paul already said in chapter 11 that women can speak. But now in chapter 14, women can't speak. So either, and this is, the, this is the kind of the controversial part, Paul is bipolar, that he doesn't remember what he said like you know a few minutes ago, which, by the way, if you believe women can't speak in church, you have to have that, you have to have that idea. Because if Paul says women can't speak, then he's a turn turn around and says, women can't speak, and you go, ha ha, women can't speak. You're not being kind of honest. Or something else is going on. 
And there's something else going on that's kind of interesting. Now, uh, another commentator, uh, Margaret, and I can't say her last name, so I'm not going to, but I've used her before because I find she's very smart. Uh, she's a, uh, she is a, a, a very deep theologian, says this about this idea of silence. Silence is called for three times in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, in verse 28, 30, and 34. In 14 to 28 and 30, silence is called for in specific situations to regu regulate congregational contributions to church meetings. The silence in verse 28 and 30 is not gender specific. It is likely the silence called for in verse 34 and also addressing a specific situation is not meant to be blanket statement to silence all women for all time in church worship services. Huh. So what could be happening to the church in Corinth? Remember I told you that Corinth is trying to blend culture and Christianity? Not a good blend. Let me show you something here. Ben Witherington says this about this uh, verse. It is very believable that these women in the Corinthian church assume that Christian prophets or prophetesses function much like the Oracle of Delphi. Pause. You know, when I say pause, I know you're still reading, but that's okay. Um, oracle of Delphi is a very famous oracle that people would come to for her to prophesy over them. Again, remember I said to you before that prophecy was not just in the Old Testament or in the Christian church, that prophets existed outside of the church. And, fun fact, the majority of the prophets outside of the church were women. Huh. So what was happening in the Corinth church was, is that women who were new Christians, or perhaps coming from the cult of Delphi, Aphrodite, and others, well, what was happening is that they believed that they were a prophetess, and that they would stand up at any point in time and just speak. And Paul's like, whoa, okay? This is not, remember, what is chapter 14 all about? What chapter 14 is all about in context, and again, go through and read it, it's about when we get together as Christ followers and have a church service, what, is it, what should it look like? And what Paul is saying, it shouldn't be chaotic. There should be some things that take place within the church service. But if you are a new Christ follower, especially a woman, and you are from, this, from the background of the Oracle of Delphi or others, well, guess what? You're going to stand up at any point in time, and you're going to just start prophesying. And your prophesying might more, be more pagan than biblical, not prompted by the Holy Spirit, but just prophesying and stuff like, Rah! and Paul's like, mm, that's not what's happening. Something else is kind of interesting, and this is what I learned uh, back in the day, and this comes from a guy named Kenneth Bailey, and his, his commentary called Paul Through the Mediterranean Eyes, Cultural Studies in 1 Corinthians, says this, Men and women may have sat separately. If this was the case, wives may have shouted across the, the divide to their husbands and asked them to explain. Let me unpack this. Remember I said to you that the church in Corinth was predominantly a Gentile church. However, some ecclesias, small groups of uh, gatherers, would be Jewish. In a Jewish synagogue, the rabbi would stand at the front with the scrolls, the men would stand in front of the rabbis, and the women and the children would be the very back. Now, in Judaism, women are, were not allowed to speak to the rabbi. Fun fact, when women speak to Jesus, they called him rabbi, it was very scandalous because women were not allowed to speak to rabbis. So could you imagine being in a Christian church where women want to ask the rabbi a question? They can't ask the rabbi a question, so what do they do? Hey, honey, ask the rabbi what he's talking about in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 2, because I don't think I got it. Okay, right? Could you imagine that for a second? So why is Paul saying women should be silent? Because he said women should talk beforehand, but now they should be silent. Well, I think that seems like kind of a good way. What is Paul trying to say? Let's not have chaos. Right? And that doesn't even have to do with scripture. Could you imagine a woman? Hey, honey, we're going to have hummus and uh, lamb for dinner. Is that okay? Can you invite the Schwartzes with you as well, too? Okay, I'll ask them. Again, I'm just, I'm just you know, I don't know if there's Schwartzes. I, I, I don't know. But you get the idea, right? That was the only Jewish last name that come to mind when I said it, right? Um, but I'm simply saying this. Like, what if, what if this is what's going on, what Paul's talking about? Now, Remember I said to you before, Christianity is nothing more than reformed Judaism. You might be a Gentile, and looking across this room, y'all are, but you actually come from a long line of Jewish thinkers. Paul was not a Gentile, he was a Jew, and he was trained as a Pharisee. So oftentimes people say Paul is making a theological assumption, but did the Old Testament or did the Jewish people believe this? 
So one of the filters I use when I try to interpret the Bible or understand the Bible is, how would a Jewish person read this? Because I think it's kind of important. Well, Claudia uh, V. Camp, she is a rabbi, but she's a Christian rabbi. Uh, she wrote she writes, uh, in this one called the Jewish Women's Archive, and this is what she says how Jewish people would understand this. Modern readers, unaccustomed to thinking of ancient women in positions of authority, may find Huldah's story remarkable. We'll get to that in a second. The biblical evidence, however, makes clear that prophecy was a role open to women and on an equal basis with men. Other examples include, and we'll get to this, Mary and Deborah in the New Testament, Anna. And the narrators of Kings and Chronicles take no notice of Huldah's gender. Huldah's story is notable in the biblical tradition in that their prophetic words of judgment are centered on written document. She authorizes what will become of the core of scripture for Judaism and Christianity. Her validation of a text thus stands as the first recognizable act in a long process of canon formation. Let's take a look at the story of Huldah. In 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, what happens is Israel has been in a time and a long period of pagan worship. So if you could imagine for a second, they've lost the Bible. Well, one day, as they're cleaning out the temple, they discover the Bible. And they go, oh, crap. Well, what are we going to do with this thing? And they start reading it, and they realize, we are living so far from what Yahweh wants for Israel. So what happens? The king says to the prophets and the, uh, so to the priests, he says, listen, go find a prophet and ask them what should we do with the scripture. Who do they, who do they find? They find a woman named Huldah. Huldah was a person who helped canonize or say, this is from God. You may not know this, but people say the formation of scripture, all, it's all men. And if you really listen to Twitter, it's all white men. It wasn't, and it certainly wasn't men. Here's an example. And again, I'm not trying to tell you anything that's not in Scripture. At UCC, one of the things we try to do is be very, very particular about how we understand Scripture. It's not my job to convince you that, that Scripture is true. It's my job to say, this is in the Bible. Do with it as you may. So the, prophets and, so the priests go to Huldah, and Huldah tells them, and they go back and tell the king. But this is not the only example we have of women operating in this way. We, as we saw in the Jewish archive for women, we have women throughout Scripture in Old Testament and New Testament operating in this way. We have a woman named Deborah. We have Miriam. And how, what does the Bible say? The prophet. We have Anna, a prophet, who sees baby Jesus. And we have women who have the gift of prophecy in Acts chapter 1. Remember I told you the Bible is broken up into three parts. Right? And I said this is a Trinitarian way of understanding it. God the Father in the Old Testament, God the Son in the letters, and God the Spirit, uh, sorry, God the Son in the Gospels, and God the Spirit in the letters. And I've said to you before that if we see an agreement in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, we go, done. Right? Not changeable, not up for debate. The Father, Son, and Spirit have agreed on a topic, and we go, done. So it should interest you to know that in God the Father, in God the Son, and God the Spirit, we have women who are prophets. So, if Paul is saying that women should be silent, either he is contradicting himself, Judaism, Jesus himself, and the understood uh, experience of the New Testament church, or something else is going on. Again, not here to say rah rah women, because please understand something. And I've said this to you before about myself. Whenever I speak, people either think I'm really conservative or I'm really liberal. I don't really get along with anybody. Because when, when I speak, like, oh, yeah, he's a very, he's a very conservative. And then I talk about women, oh, he's a liberal. And I just want to say to people conservative and liberal are, are, are postmodern terms. I choose to be biblical. And if biblical ticks off both sides, I'm happy to do so. Like, I don't know if a spiritual gift of annoying people is one, but I got it. And by the bucket loads. And if my wife was up here, I'd be like, yeah, preach. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm telling you right now, being biblical, you're going to offend everybody. Because we have gotten so far from the Bible, it's not even funny. As, again, the uh, survey you looked at at the very beginning. Now, let me just show you something real quick as well, too. And this is always a point that I would, whenever I had these conversations with my Reformed brothers, not sisters, but Reforms, um, 
I always say, I always point this out, because I've, by the way, I've studied this topic for about 20 years. Just so you know, when I was back in Bible college, I actually thought women weren't allowed to be pastors. That was until I sat down with my mentor, Dr. Ron Kidd, and I very braggingly said I understood this topic. He says, oh, really? Come to my office. And for three hours, he went through scriptures with me. Scriptures. Not culture. Not my opinion. He just said, get your Bible out. By the way, when a professor says to that to you, you know you're in trouble. He went through Huldah, Miriam, Deborah, Anna, all, again, example after example. And he said to me, the two scriptures, 1 Timothy, 2 Corinthians 14, if you believe these two scriptures trump these scriptures, you've got to show me the reason why. And I was like, oh, I had no idea. But again, biblical, please hear me very clearly. Lots of terms can be applied to people today about what th how they identify themselves. I prefer, I'm just simply a student of scripture. That's all I am. And I'm not here to tell you what to believe. It's not how I roll at UCC. But I am here to bug you with scriptures that perhaps might challenge your predisposed notion. Verse 26, which by the way comes before verse 34 in case you didn't understand that. Look what Paul says. Well, my brothers and sisters, let's summarize. When you meet together, one will sing, another will teach, another will tell some special revelation God has given, one will speak in tongues, another will interpret what is said. But everything is done, must strengthen all of you. Who is he addressing this scripture for? Follow the fun arrow. Brothers and sisters. So, brothers and sisters, this is what you get to do. But in verse 34, Paul says women should be silent. Again, he couldn't be that bipolar to forget what he said, like even like 30 seconds ago, could he? UCC, we're not based upon, or not built upon, hey, this is what culture is, so we want to be cool and hip and be cultural too. I've always found that the Bible is ahead of culture no matter what culture is saying. I just wish Christians would remember that. We don't, we don't, we don't talk about women in this way just be, be cultural. We talk about women this way to be biblical. And that's, that's as it should be. So the environmental movement, wonderful. But they're just ripping off Christianity again. Why? Christians forgot what they were supposed to be. Stewards of the environment, not takers of it. We're meant to live in harmony with the environment, not use it to its, to its last extent and not even you or good anymore. Christianity has always been in regards to racial justice, gender justice. Like you just pick, what, pick a topic. I'll tell you right now and... You want to have this conversation with me? Bring Kleenexes because you will cry. I'm telling you right now, the gospel has always been ahead of culture. It's always been ahead of culture. And <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's, it's far ahead of every other religion in the world. There is a reason why refugees are fleeing to certain types of country. Judeo-Christian legal systems are far superior than others. Yeah, you can tweet me. I'm not on Twitter. I don't care. Um, now, look how Paul wraps this up, okay? Take a look at verse 40. Paul says this, but be sure that everything is done properly and in order. I thought this is kind of an interesting way to end off this chapter. We talk about prophecy. We talk about tongues. We talk about women. But what's Paul's goal at the end of chapter 14? Look what he says. Be sure that everything is done properly. So I thought, properly? What does properly mean? Like, I looked at the Greek in her, and what's interesting is I found out in the Greek is the word properly actually has an aesthetic or a beautiful part of it, right? So it means bearing oneself becomingly to be beautiful in speech or behavior. So what's the implication of this? That our gatherings and treatment of each other shows how beautiful the gospel is. Well, I'll tell you right now, the world thinks the gospel is ugly. Why? How are you treating each other? How are we treating others? Ugly. Absolute ugliness out there right now. And by Christians. I forgive culture for being ugly. Why? Because they have no, uh, no better way of understanding it. I do not like it when Christians act ugly. Because everything about the gospel is about the beauty of the gospel. And when we act ugly, speak ugly, in social media, in our personal lives, in our corporate structures, attacking other churches. And again, please hear me very clearly. You think you're annoyed with other pastors, how they're behaving. Try being a pastor. Because all I have to do is respond to these individuals, to people who ask me, well, is your church an anti? Are you a lady? It's like, 
please hear me very clearly. These are not labels that Christians identify by. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Prince and princesses in the kingdom of heaven. All these other labels, they're cultural. And if you want to identify this way, if you want to be that, or you want to accept this, or you want to whatever, that's cool. Right? But that's not what Christianity is. So what does Paul say? Be proper. Be beautiful. And beauty is we treat each other in the image of God. Image of God isn't because you're a Christ follower. Image of God is because you're created by the creator, which means anybody out there you, exp you encounter in school, in work, at home, wherever you might be, who thinks opposite to you, different religion, atheistic, whatever it might be, you have to always remember. They're made in the image of God. Therefore, they're worthy of, of dignity and not you yelling at them and screaming at them because they think differently about you, about a cultural label. See, chapter 14 is kind of interesting. And again, I think Paul got a little bit of verbal diarrhea here. And I broke it up. I parsed it out. I hope that's okay. If it's not, who cares? Uh, but I parsed it out this way because what I really took away from chapter 14, Christians just get along. Christians act like Jesus. Just stop the ugliness and be beautiful because the gospel is beautiful. In every aspect of everything, be beautiful. Let's pray. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Remember, we do this to reflect, to ponder. I realize that at the end of the sermon, you guys are already looking to leave and all that, and that's fine. But I just want this to be a Holy Spirit moment where perhaps the Spirit of God might speak to you. And by speaking to you, I, it, it might be that you have been acting ugly in social media, in personal life. The beauty of the gospel has been drained from you because you've been behaving as the world behaves. First and foremost, we as Christ followers, let's treat each other with graciousness and love. Because sweet, merciful, like, like we can't even agree on that, then I don't know what else is going on. But then let's go beyond the pagans and let's treat those who think differently than us, look differently than us, with the same type of love as well too. Remember, love is patient, love is kind, love is all these things, but these are not applied to you know, the, your romantic partner, but it's applied to the world. And my hope is at UCC, my hope is in your lives, that we confront our, our own prejudices, our own preconceived notions, and as authentic disciples of Jesus, we continue to follow the way of love. We continue to follow the way of love. And I know that in the world, it has become increasingly antithetical towards the idea of the gospel. It's just more opportunities for us to be Christ followers. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come right now and you would just speak to us. We've already sung about you, Holy Spirit, but we ask right now that you would come and you would speak, you would challenge, and yes, you would conform us to the image of Jesus. Jesus, please forgive us when we adopt cultural labels to identify by or to identify others. Instead, Lord Jesus, let us be beautiful in the gospel sense by our treatment of others. Spirit of the Most High God, I pray that you would stir within us. And for those here this morning who perhaps are tired, are feeling dead because of relational issues or work issues or school issues or just living in the world. Spirit of the Most High God, I pray that you would revive us to life once again in Jesus' name. Help us not to forget that we love not because the person is lovable, but because our Creator made them. And that dignity and respect is theirs by design. Holy Spirit, remind us of this today, tomorrow, and for the rest of our lives. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.